I greet you in the name of the shepherd, the one who welcomes us as we gather at the manger this day, Jesus Christ our Lord. It's in his name I welcome you to this very special day that we begin with our time of worshiping together. I am Jim Miller, the senior pastor here at Grace, along with Deacon Helen Ballou. We have the honor of leading you in our service today with all who help and contribute to this service. It will be a day of blessing. It's a blessing to have you here. We invite everyone to please take a moment and sign the registration book and pass that along to the person beside you. And to all who are joining us online, those of you on Zoom, if you would just take a moment and put your name in the chat. And to all our Facebook friends, we welcome you. And those on YouTube who will view this service later, we are honored to worship with you and to celebrate the Christmas joy with you. It is a day of joy. It's a joy to me to see our, we typically have two services here at Grace on a Sunday morning and to have a combined service invites us and provides us the opportunity to see one another. So I'm just so grateful. And to our extended family, as I know we have uh, relatives here, we have folks who are traveling through. I hope that you are feeling at home already. And if you do not already have a home church, we would love to have you as part of our church community here at Grace. We have a website, graceumc.org, that'll tell you much about what's happening in the life of the church, and so look forward to our beginning the year right, as we will gather for some special times during the year, not only on Sundays, but throughout the week. Speaking of special times, we have opportunity to gather this night. I was just talking with someone who was saying that they heard of a church, if you came to all five services, you got a coffee mug, you got a ticket punch there. Now, we don't have five, we have four, but if you make all four, I'll see that you get a coffee mug there, okay? And I would love to look forward to our worshiping with you. We have our five o'clock service, this is our children's pageant, and then our eight and 11 p.m. with our lessons and carols and 11 p.m. Holy Communion. You're invited to all. If you can't make it, uh, please, we'll be broadcasting both the 8 o'clock and the 11 o'clock. This morning, we will be serving Holy Communion. I think of a church community, a church family gathering together, gathering around table, where our altar is our table, that sign that Christ gathers with us. So this may be your first Sunday here. All are invited. We practice what is known as open communion. Everyone is invited to receive all the elements are gluten-free, and we have the safety packets available as well. Also in this service, there will be a time of sharing the peace, where we'll be invited to celebrate God's presence as we turn and speak with one another. However you're comfortable, whether it's air hugs, hugs, handshakes, or if you're a little bit uh, leery of and you don't want to share anything uh, negative, I understand germ-wise, you can just, uh, we invite you to remain seated during this time. But again, we just want to celebrate the fact you're here. And I know God's heart is warmed with the fact that you've come to worship this day. Welcome to the service. At this time, Deacon Helen will lead us in our call to worship. Stop. Listen. Pay attention. Love is coming near. We wait in the love of the coming Messiah that transforms us. The hope bringer, peacemaker, joy sustainer grows in a womb, preparing to be born among us. We wait in the love of the coming Messiah that transforms us. With Mary, we long for the coming of the child who will transform the world bringing justice where injustice reigns, fullness where hunger persists, and favor to the ones the world calls lowly. We wait in the love of the coming Messiah that transforms us. So let us join our voices and our lives in magnifying God our Savior. We come to wait. I invite you now to stand as you are able for hymn number 221 in the bleak midwinter.
we bring this day to give unto him our hearts. I invite you to be seated, please. Let us take this time to be cleansed that we may be filled anew with his presence as we offer our prayer of confession. Hear these words. Every notion we have about power, success, wealth, and achievement, God takes and tosses out the window. More importantly, God comes to us to upset our notion that we have to save ourselves. In Jesus, God comes to us, removing our sin, our failures, our expectations, so we might have new life. Please join me as we pray, say. We confess we are not the people you hope us to be, Advent God. The very ones you favor, we too often ignore or ridicule. The ones you knock off their pedestals, we admire and emulate. We are so focused on having more and more, we risk being sent away empty. Forgive us, mighty God, and look with grace upon us, we would live secure in your love. We would be the ones of peace for our world. We would seek to do your will, as did Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. Even now, yes, even in this very moment, God comes to us bringing hope, bringing forgiveness, bringing grace as freely offered gifts to us. May we open our hearts to the God who is with us and receive the gifts which have been offered to us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Celebrating God's presence, I invite you to stand and exchange signs of peace with one another. The peace of the Lord be with you. And so we gather on this Christmas Eve morning, which is also the fourth Sunday of Advent. And this morning we'll be led in our reading of, of the Advent wreath by the Freeburn family. We'll be singing a hymn of response, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, the fourth verse. When the angel Gabriel visited Mary, announcing God's plan for her to conceive and give birth to the Messiah, 
Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? And yet only a few months later, Mary sings to Elizabeth, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. We, like Mary, hear God's call to be part of making God's dream for our salvation and flourishing a reality. And we question, how can this be? I am only. We, like Mary, the onlys that make us hesitate are gifts God can and will use as God's love transforms us into bearers of good news. We wait as people who have encountered divine love that disrupts the status quo and ushers us into abundant life, marked by mutual love and peace that flows from the flourishing of all people. We light these candles as signs of our shocking hope, our just peace, our fearless joy, and the love that transforms us. May love grow within us, transforming us into bold witnesses of God's salvation with our voices and our lives. Amen. Thank you so much, and a special thanks to all of those who have led our service of the Advent wreath throughout this special season. Speaking of special, we are so grateful to have our younger children with us this morning. Always look forward to our time together, so I invite all our children to join me up front for this morning's children's message. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Good to see you all. Well, you ready? All right. An exciting day, isn't it? To me, this is one of the most exciting days of all the Christian year when we gather on this fourth Sunday of Advent. And this year being Christmas Eve, why, we'll have our special time tonight. So I just look forward. You're going to see this very space transform just between our, our time here now and, and tonight. There's still a lot to do. Now, I'd imagine someone has asked you this question somewhere in this four-week season of Advent. The question being, what do you want for Christmas? Did anybody ask you that? Anybody in there? Now, I realize it's sort of the 11th hour for that question, isn't it, Tara? Meaning, you know, right? So, uh, so that has probably already been thought of and, and been discussed, and, that, and that's fine, and that, that's important, and that leads to the fun. But there's an even more important question that needs to be asked. But it's not a question I'm going to ask you, but it's a question I hope that each of you and each of us will take time to ask 
this special day. That is, to ask this question of Jesus. What do you want for Christmas? I mean, after all, it is his birthday. What do you suppose that answer might be? As we think about the gift that he brings to this world, the gift being peace, I believe in my heart that's the gift Jesus wants us to know and is the gift that he offers to this world. But for each of us, not only today, but each day, to ask that question, and you might ask it in a different way. It won't always be the holiday Christmas. But Lord, what is it you want? What do you want me to do for you? That will bring you a joy. It won't always be easy. It couldn't have been easy for Mary and Joseph, after all, could it? Suddenly this news, she was going to have a baby, and they were going to have to make this journey to Bethlehem. And they didn't get in a car or fly on a plane, did they? No, it was, a, it was a long journey. And there would be challenging days ahead. Yet there is a joy, there is a peace, each time we think about that holy night, God working through them to bring God's gift to us. So there's a lot to do today, isn't there? And I know you have your list and I have mine. But there's something very important we do each Christmas Eve. And that is, you'll notice the nativity scene behind me here that we've been looking at throughout the season. But there's one piece missing, isn't there? What needs to be in that nativity scene to make it complete? The baby Jesus, that's right. So our acolyte and priest, would you be willing to help, Lord? She's gonna, would you walk him around to Laura and help him place that in there? Of course, if you'll just follow her, okay? She'll bring you right back, I promise. Okay, all right, thank you, Prince. She's gonna lead you around there. What Prince is gonna be doing is placing the baby Jesus in the nativity scene. This makes the story complete, doesn't it? And that's true for your life and mine. We can have all the wonderful things we wish for at Christmas, but the one true need we have that we recognize and we grow in our need for throughout our lives is our need for Jesus. Now as our nativity has been made complete, I hope that your life and the life of this world will be made complete when we have Jesus at the center of all that we're about. Thank you so much, Prince and Lauren, for taking that journey. And I want to invite each of you to a journey of faith and following Jesus each and every day. So Merry Christmas to you, and thank you. And as you go forth, we have our nursery care, and parents, we have our parlor. If you need a place to stretch, but we'd love to have you here. And Laurel has a very important gift as well. We have a gingerbread man for you as you go on your way. Merry Christmas to you all. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Prince, for helping. This time I'd like to invite all who are able to please stand for our gospel reading as Millicent shares it with us. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Our reading today is from the book of Luke 1, 26 to 38. We start from verse 26. In the sixth month of the angel, Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his word and pondered, pondered what sort of greeting this might be. 
The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestors, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the sudden the servant of the Lord, let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. That ends the reading of today. May he bless our soul for the salvation of our life. Amen. I invite you to pray with me. Lord, we thank you for this holy moment. A moment in which we just take time to breathe. To breathe in your presence anew. To breathe out all that is not of your will. Thank you for the assurance of your word and for the daily challenge that it brings. Lord, as your Holy Spirit was at work then, may your same Holy Spirit work and use this time to your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I read recently of the little boy who was invited to be part of the Christmas pageant had the role of an angel. He worked on his lines for weeks, practicing. Fear not. Behold, I bring you good news of great joy for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall see a babe wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. Oh, he practiced his mom practiced with him, his grandma practiced with him, and the night of the pageant arrived. And they gathered, and then with the floodlight shining upon him and the hushed crowd and all looking at him, you can imagine what's happened. We've all been there. He froze for just that moment. The lines he had practiced for so long knew without hesitation nothing was coming out. Finally, even with his mother and grandmother and the crowd saying, do not be afraid, do not be afraid, giving him the lines, nothing. But then as if a light bulb lit up, he looked out in the crowd and said, do I have news for you? <laughs> My friends, do I have news for you this day? Like the town criers of old, the newspaper boys crying out, extra, extra, read all about it when we had the print newspapers in our hands. Do I have news for you? The extraordinary is entering into the ordinary. Christ is present. And this is the joyous news that we celebrate this day as we come to the table. The extraordinary coming into our ordinary lives. Now, don't hear that term ordinary as meaning less than in any way. 
I remind you of numerical numbers and ordinal numbers, first, second, and third. Soon we will enter into what's known in the liturgical season as ordinary time. But that doesn't mean ho-hum or less than. It's a time, ordinary time is a time for growth, maturity. A time in which the mystery of Christ is called to penetrate ever more deeply into history until all things are finally caught up in Christ. To go deeper in our faith. To mature in our faith. I won an office contest years ago at the saying, you're only young once, I read, but you can be immature forever. We're only young once, true. But none of us have to remain immature in our faith because the extraordinary one is present and is at work in this world. And that's what gives us hope. I pray that in our ordinary lives, there is a desire to go deeper, to mature, in our faith. I love this story I came across recently. It talks about how Christmas Surprises is written this way. Under a cultural exchange program, Alan Abrinsky and his family in Roanoke, Texas, were host to a rabbi from Russia at Christmas time. They decided to introduce him to a culinary treat that was probably not available in his country. They took him to their favorite Chinese restaurant. Throughout the meal, the rabbi spoke excitedly about the wonders of North America in comparison to the bleak conditions in his homeland. When they had finished eating, the waiter brought the check and presented each of them with a small brass Christmas tree ornament as a seasonal gift. They all laughed when Abrinsky's father pointed out that the ornaments were stamped, Made in India. But the laughter subsided when they saw that the rabbi was quietly crying. Concerned, Abramsky's father asked the rabbi if he was offended because he had been given a gift for a Christian holiday. He smiled and shook his head and said, I was shedding tears of joy to be in a wonderful country in which a Buddhist gives a Jew a Christmas gift made by a Hindu. (laughs) Now, that that is a time of miracles. This is a time of stories, four stories. From time to time, we hear someone say, wouldn't it be great if it could be Christmas all year long? Surprise. That was God's intent. That's why God invaded our planet and gave us the gift of God's Son. There's only one thing that stands in the way of celebrating Christmas all year long, and that's you and I. Let's not stand in the way any longer for what God is seeking to do in your life and in mine. The extraordinary, seeking to enter in. Christmas all year, I don't know that we could keep the pace that we establish with our shopping and baking and and running around. No. But if Christmas means Christ at the center, the extraordinary being in our hearts and guiding us in our everyday living and working in our ordinary lives, in our work and where we live, where we play, that will have a transforming effect upon this world. Raj Natelli writes about this ordinary effect in the following piece in which he shares. says, The glory of Christmas came about by the willingness of ordinary people to obey God's claim on their lives. The ultimate scandal is that God would enter human life with all its depravity, violence, and corruption. Therefore, the Annunciation ultimately is an announcement of hope for humankind. God has not abandoned us to the consequences of our own sinfulness. Rather, 
God has sent Jesus as our deliverer, there's another way. A commonwealth under Jesus' lordship that is without end. My friends, there is another way. On this day, which Bethlehem market is closed because of war, because of fighting. On this day in which there is brokenness, where people are hurting and grieving, struggling. There is a way that we are promised in Jesus Christ. The extraordinary meets us right where we're at. Adele continues when he shares a moment of realization for Mary and eventually for us. Mary recognizes what all Christian believers must recognize that we, creatures before the Creator God, are incapable in and of ourselves of accomplishing God's will. In other words, the angel Gabriel's words provide a reminder that our lives are not initiated wholly by human effort and intention. It takes the working of the extraordinary. God willing. God is willing to enter in. We don't have to remain where we're at with what's happening in this world. It's been a joy watching my young grandchildren during this season. I've asked my four-year-old granddaughter on more than one occasion, what, what do you want for Christmas? And she keeps talking about this character named Elsa. Now, I must confess, I don't live under a rock. But I've never seen the movie Frozen, or even the one that's followed since it, or any variations of it. I went to school with an Elsa. I have an Aunt Elsie, but I have no clue as to who she is. I do not know. We may think that we are out of the loop. We don't understand the story, or seem so distant, Mary and Joseph and shepherds and later Magi. It's hard to relate to what this story means to my life today. But the expression, I don't know, that I can relate to. Because I encounter others and I have faced moments myself where we just don't know. I don't know. I'm going to face the future without my loved one, I've heard grieving folks say. I don't know what I'm going to do in this relationship where there is so much angst, where there is so much brokenness. I don't know how I'm going to afford the home that we're living in as a family. I don't know how I'm going to feed my family. I don't know how I'm going to keep my position at my work with what's being asked of me. I don't know. What might we draw from this account for those moments that we do not know? This passage that Millicent shared with us ends with two powerful verses where the angel instructs Mary, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary responds, here am I servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. If we could allow those verses to penetrate our lives, if we could be reminded that nothing is impossible for God, and if we could daily offer ourselves as Mary does, here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me, not according to Jim, not according to me, but rather according to your word. Well, how do we get there? Well, I believe Mary gives us a clue. I mean, the angel shares with her a lot of information. <laughs> There's like, Seven rapid points there, right in the low. This is going to happen, and this is going to happen, and this child that's going to be born to you, he's going to be this, going to be that. None of that seems to bring 
peace and assurance. But oh, when the angel tells her about her relative Elizabeth, that brings an assurance, a peace like nothing else. Timothy Atkins Jones reflects on that when he writes, In the end, it was the news that Elizabeth had also conceived in a miraculous manner that convinced Mary to accept the announcement. She asked no additional questions after that. The Greek root of the phrase, even Elizabeth, certainly calls attention to the improbability of conception at her advanced age. But in the context of Mary's reservations, the phrase assures her that Elizabeth, her relative, would have a similar experience. It was the assurance that another woman, someone she knew well, would walk with her during this uncertain journey that convinced Mary. Elizabeth likely understood Mary's predicament more than anyone else. It was the prospect of a shared experience that mattered to Mary more than any of those grand promises from Gabriel. In this moment, Mary comprehends that her whole life, the whole world, is about to be rearranged. She ascribes more credence to God's vision for human community than to naysayers whose words suppress courage. How might, where might, you offer this Christmas gift, the gift of shared experience this season? That is, how might we be an Elizabeth? How might we be a Mary? Who do you know who is struggling that you can journey with, that you can reach out to this season? Or perhaps you yourself are the one who's struggling. How might we, as your church family, your church community, walk beside you? What would it look like to be part of our prayer group that will be gathering on Wednesdays in the new year? What would it look like to be part of our missions work we'll be hearing about on January 6th as we gather and celebrate Kaz Memorial and his contributions to mission and we hear about our work together as a church? What would it look like to be part of our youth group, to come to Sunday school, adult and children's Sunday schools? What would it look like to find companions in your faith journey? walking with you. This is ours to know. We see the story unfold. We'll read it more closely tonight. Shepherds gathering around the special family in the midst of all the uncertainty of the world. The extraordinary enters in. And this is our hope as we celebrate the sacrament this morning. Christ is willing to enter in. God becoming vulnerable that we may offer our lives anew unto him. So I want to give you these challenges as we face this special season anew. I invite you this morning to reflect on what it would look like to allow Mary's response, here am I, the servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word to become your response. Secondly, the Annunciation concludes with the promise, for nothing is impossible for God. How can we as a church share this announcement to bring hope into the ordinary today? How might you share this message of hope this Christmas? Lastly, ask the Lord this very simple, yet potentially life-changing question. What do you want for Christmas? What can you give God? this Christmas, the opportunity to welcome the extraordinary into our ordinary life, a life created by God, a life to be sustained and empowered by God, as ours to know this Christmas, what a gift may we be willing to receive anew this morning. So with thanksgiving in our hearts, we take this time to give back to God as we take time for our morning offering and have this special music from our bell choir.
much. I invite you now to join me in our words of the great thanksgiving, and this morning we will be singing our responses. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets, who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, when nations shall not lift up sword against nation, and neither shall they learn war any more. And so as your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Thank you. And blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be a light to the nations. You scatter the proud in the imagination of their hearts and have mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. You put down the mighty from their thrones and exalt those of low degree. You fill the hungry with good things and the rich you send empty away. Your own Son came among us as a servant to be Emmanuel, your presence with us. He humbled himself in obedience to your will and freely accepted death on a cross. By the baptism of his suffering death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out 
out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Now, as children of God, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The body of Christ broken for us, the blood of Christ shed for us, the extraordinary meets us in this moment. Come, all are invited. The ushers will guide you forward.
as Deacon Ellen will be leading us in our prayer after communion this morning, the white rose on our altars in loving memory of Glenn Sunderland. Uh, Glenn passed away last Sunday evening, and we celebrated his life this past Friday. So we're asking that you be keeping uh, his wife Frances and children Rachel and Michelle in prayers and the entire family for the Sunderland family. Also want to update you on Kwame, Kwame Frimpong, our bookkeeper is now at Collingswood Nursing and Rehabilitation Center, and Kwame may be listening to our service today, so Kwame, we continue to keep you in our prayers. Thank you. Friends in Christ, let us pray. Holy One, hope of the world, nothing is impossible with you. We rejoice because you are with us and with all of your good creation. Thank you for the gift of this holy meal and for your abundant grace. We praise you for favoring the humble and the homeless, for lifting up people who are burdened or bullied, for renewing your vision within us when we stumble, for healing people who suffer, and for comforting those who grieve. Help us to be like Mary, to say, yes, Lord, here we are. Let your will be done through us. May your grace fill our hearts, minds, and souls, and move us to think, speak, and act in ways that reflect you. Use us, we pray, to bring the good news of your love to others. Thank you for teaching and leading your church to serve in the world with compassion and justice. We pray for your reign of peace to come as we anticipate your birth anew. Lord, in your love, we have hope. Amen. I invite you now to stand for hymn number 250, Once in Royal David City.
please be seated. And now as we go forth, I offer this benediction. May you be filled with the wonder of Mary, the obedience of Joseph, the joy of the angels, the eagerness of the shepherds, the determination of the Magi, and the peace of the Christ child. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Merry Christmas to you. Look forward to our worship tonight.